Well, this is Joe McGee. Welcome to our podcast. Make sure that you subscribe and please share the podcast with your friends. That is the number one way you can help us reach people with God's love and healing. We love you guys. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, everybody. It's Joe and Angel. Welcome to another Mailbag Monday where Angel and I take time and answer some questions. We've got a ton of them in here, so we better jump in. We get get started today, Angel. Yes. Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. So let's just jump in. My significant other insists on listening to videos on their phone while I am trying to watch TV. Guilty. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to start a fight, but who doesn't get that it is being rude? Well, you're talking to the wrong people because. No, I'm, I'm the person, you know, I do it. Yes. Angel does it all the time. Angel will say, Hey, you want to watch a movie? Sure. I'm going to sit down. Two minutes in the movie, she's on her, she's on her computer. <laughs> and so, uh, I think we're really normal people, but, uh, we don't watch movies at the same time. We don't because I'm not interested in what she's interested in. I love Angel. She's the love of my life. She saved my life. I mean, I love her a lot. <laughs> well, well, and I can't watch the same John Wayne movie 15 times. That's the, my problem. Joe literally could lip sync along with him. Um, <laughs> so uh, now my children think I probably need to go and uh, get tested for something <laughs> because my mind is always working overtime. So uh, I just say it helps me relax, to be honest with you. Now, I don't turn the volume on. If you're watching a movie, yes, I'll put in a headphone Yes, in one ear. And then the other ear, I listen to the movie that I've probably seen 500 well, times. Well, every, every personality is different. You have to do a personality test because there are four basic personalities. and They've got tests all over America for it. But uh, Angela, she multitasks. She cannot do one thing. She's got to be doing at least three things at one time. Me, I'm single-minded. I do one thing at a time. You start talking to me, I got to turn the volume off the TV and look at you. Because I can't do two things at one time. I'm not, I'm not going to remember a thing you said. If I'm watching TV or a ball game or a movie, I got to focus on you. And I know that. So uh, that's what I do. So you marry your opposite. You, you just do. So uh, people confuse love as well. We love the same thing. No opposites attract. We've taught on marriage for years. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I say it all the time. It's, it's, it's Adam and Eve. It's two opposite people, male and females. The, the opposites attract. And, uh, and so, uh, when you get married, so many couples have come to us and we're so alike. We're in love. We're going to get married. It's, no, you're not alike at all. You're total opposites. And the longer you're married, the more that's going to show up. And so, uh, but it's normal. It's the way God did it. Uh, two are better than one, not because you agree, because you see the problem from a different viewpoint. And so it's an, it's an advantage to think different. So, uh, you know, sitting in a watch in front of a TV and plan of game. That's normal. That's very, very psychology 101. That's very normal. You're not the same people. So, uh, well, I think, I think, you know, when I was a young woman, which I'm still young, my my youth is renewed like the Eagles, but when I was a much younger woman, uh, stuff like that would have bothered me a lot because I would feel like you're not giving me your full attention. You're not, uh, engaged. You're distracted, blah, 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 blah. But now, that I'm older, I just think wiser. Yeah, and way more relaxed. Way yeah. more relaxed. Uh, what does it matter? I don't need your undivided attention. And and I mean, it's like I don't want major on a minor. I mean, when I was in my twenties, I would major on a minor. Oof. Yeah, I but- mean, I would. They would. You know, that would. I was the worst at it. But so now. That's what helps me relax. Multitasking. Like I like to read stuff while I'm. Now, I don't listen to videos most of the time when I'm watching movies. I'm usually reading. Oh, she's on the phone. She's on the phone. She angels on so many people. Every day she's on the phone with at least a dozen, maybe two dozen people. Every time she's on the phone, she's doing something on her computer at the same time. Well, I might be looking up something that we're talking about that could give them some information. And, and you might be looking up something totally not related. But be. she can do that. That's normal for Angel. It's just normal. So uh, you don't marry your same person. You marry your opposite. So. One of the biggest things, though, is I think that, uh, like I said, when I was younger, I would just major on minors big mm. time and uh, it wasted a lot of my time and attention. Energy. And energy, yeah. And so it doesn't mean that the spouse doesn't care or isn't as engaged. It's just 
you know, sometimes you need stuff to unwind and that helps me unwind. Yeah. Now, if you, it would offend me, to be honest with you, if we were having a conversation and you suddenly picked up your phone and started scrolling. Uh, and we, really? Well, especially if it was a serious conversation. Really? If we were talking. That's fascinating. <laughs> I'm guilty of that, too. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, evidently, we need to go to counseling over this, man. <laughs> you marry your opposite. That's yeah. the bottom line. You do. So don't make a big thing out of it. It's, not, it's You know, I mean, can you answer the frustration of, well, I want you to do this with me. Well, that's going to relax me a lot, you know? And so the longer I sit here, the tighter I'm going to get and the matter I'm going to get, the more frustrated I'm going to get. So there'll be no hugging and kissing the night. It's like you're opposite. So just enjoy life together. Yeah. I remember when uh, my kids were in high school, uh, I, w- I was a single mother and my daughter, who is always got a smile on her face, always very friendly. So does her son. When you, yes, always. All, all, always. And you would think that. She's just the nicest person in the world. And she is. <laughs> and she has changed since she's gotten married. But boy, <laughs> in the morning, we couldn't speak for 30 minutes because she needed to wake up slow. So we were all like tiptoeing around. And she's 4'11", and she had these big Elmo slippers on. It was so funny. And take everything you had not to laugh. But you didn't because you knew that wrath was coming if you did. So uh it, it's not completely fair to tip, have to tiptoe around somebody because nope. they don't like the way you're doing things. Nope. So, you know, I mean, that's the re- nature of relationships and ebb and a flow, a give and a take. So, And you got to verbally confirm one another. Honey, I love you, but I'm not going to sit here with you. Honey, I love you, but I'm not going to be quiet. I love you, but I'm gonna, I'll go in the other room. You know, I love you. I do. I'm married. I love you, but we're not the same. We're just yeah. not the same. Yeah. And I, 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 Joe knows I'm not. I'm not a big John Wayne fan. She's not John Wayne at all. I'm like, Joe, didn't you just watch that movie last week? Yes, I did. I'm watching it again, and I enjoy it even more the the hundredth time. I know how it ends. It ends good. I like that. Makes me feel really fine. <laughs> We're talking about Joe, who loves Christmas music year-round. Year-round. So Every morning when I'm shaving on the other end of the house in my bathroom, I got Christmas music playing on my iPhone. So is that Christmas music? Yes, ma'am. And I really enjoy every. I like Burl Ives. <laughs> Only time I like it is around Thanksgiving. You can start it up, and I really like it through the holidays. Woo! Anyway. So, jingle bell, jingle So you're not going through anything anybody else No, you're business. not. You're normal. You're normal. Yes. So uh, I will. T- well, no, I, won't, I won't add Come that. on. I'm, I need to help her out because well, I understand I, the frustration. We I do, do. I do understand the frustration. Well, I had a friend one time that said, And I learned this when I did claims, you know, mirror it back to them. So if you find something that uh, that they really like and they want you to be a part of mirror that behavior back to them and then they'll understand it better. And and it's not necessarily to to get to them or to make a mad. It's just say, okay, yeah, yeah. okay, I get it. I get it. I'll be a little bit more empathetic to that. now. And and you got to remember one thing. We don't make this too long, but Jesus always answered a question with a question. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get you to think about. It. Does that upset you? Is there something wrong? Don't ever take each other into your past. You always. You never. You should have. You could have. You never pay attention to me, babe. I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I married you. I love you. What do you mean? I don't ever pay attention. And what you're saying, you're venting your own personal frustration, and you need to get over it. You need to you need to grow up and be an adult. This isn't two kids playing on the playground. These are two married people, and so just learn to flow with it. And it'll be great. You just need to think this is God's gift for you. You're, they're your total opposite, but they are God's gift for you. So enjoy the process. Enjoy the gift. Yes. Okay, Joe, my wife and I were doing our Bible reading, and she started asking questions. One was, oh, see, we're going to dive in deep now. One was, why did God let everything Joe loved die and let all that misery come on him? After that, she asked me why Job's wife didn't die. I wanted to answer, but I knew it was going to lead to a fight. I mean, the answer is obvious, right? Obviously not. (laughs) (laughs) Woo! Well, Joe is actually Joe's favorite. My favorite book in the Bible. So go ahead, Joe. Take it away. Well, uh, you understand during Job's lifetime, there was no Bible. There was no New Testament, no Old Testament. There was no fathers of the faith. It was just Job. He was the richest man in the whole planet. You know, blessed, highly favored, 
tons of kids, lots of cattle, lots of sheep, lots of money, lots of love from his wife. And, uh, and the devil came to God. It's a true story. The devil comes to God and the devil's already been kicked out of heaven. I, I got to shorten this up. The devil's been kicked out of heaven. So he comes, the angels are reporting to God. This really gives you background. What's going on in heaven? The angels are reporting to God. And so they come, so Lucifer shows up and God asks us, where have you been, Lucifer? And Lucifer answered in Job 1. He said, well, I've been patrolling the earth, walking back to and fro, trying to find someone to devour. He's mad. He's going to rip something up. So God points out, Job, have you considered my servant, Job? I said, God, I appreciate you love me, but don't point me out to the devil. <laughs> but he was sure. trying to show something. Now, many people believe that Genesis is the oldest book of the Bible. It might be. I personally believe Job's the oldest book. It doesn't change in theology whatsoever. But it starts with Job. Everything kind of starts there with Job. It's like, you said, listen, consider my servant Job. And, jo- and the devil said, well, no wonder, you know, you bless the socks. So he's filthy, stinking rich. And his wife's sucking lips off his face. And all the kids are doing great. But you take away all that stuff, he'll curse you to your face. And God says to the devil, go ahead. What? Go ahead. Take it away from him. The oldest book I think of the Bible, Job, God was trying to make a point. God said, there are people that love me because of me, not because I bless them, not because I made them rich, not because I got them married to a beautiful spouse. People love me for me. The oldest book's trying to make a point. God wants people that love him. Jesus was looking for people that loved him for him, not for what he did for them. I mean, the 12 apostles, all, most of them died, died upside down, died, I mean, a horrible death except for John. They loved Jesus. They realized that was the son of God. He gave us life for me. He was raised from the dead for me. I will give my life for him. And it's a, it's a love that you can't even imagine, but it started with Job. And so the devil took everything. You know, the storm came, the house fell on the kids. They're all eating dinner together. All the kids died. Somebody stole all of his cattle, stole all of his sheep. And, and he, you know, it's, it's like it was horrible. Well, the next day, the angels are born to God, and they come before God. It Lucifer comes back again. And God again points out Job, have you considered my servant Job? And so, yeah, I mean, he took all the stuff. He still worships me. He still loves me. He's broke. He's got no, no cattle. All those kids have died, but he still loves me. He said, well, you take away his health. And he'll curse it to your face. God says, fine, but you can't kill him. So the balls come up on his body. And you got a whole long, several chapters of the story of the horribleness of Job. And at the end, you know, Job never complains, never grabs. His wife says, why don't you curse God and die? So the reason Job's wife stayed alive, she's the pain in his backside. It's like all the bad stuff's going on. He, God just let it happen. Why? Wow, he's trying to show the devil something. And finally at the end, you get down to the next to last chapter, and God's talking, uh, or God hadn't been talking. Job's talking. His friends are asking, so why, why don't you just curse God and die? And so Job uttered these words. He said, well, what good is it to serve God? That's all he said. What good is it to serve God? He served him the whole time, all those old chapters, all the bad stuff. What good is it to serve God? And then God finally spoke up. He's not talking several chapters. What did you just say? So said, what? What did you just say? And Job won't answer. And God asked him several questions. Have you ever walked on the bottom of the ocean? Job says, no. God said, I have. You ever flown through space, the speed of light? Job said, no. God said, I, he took the whole chapter of questions. And finally, at the end, he said, I'm God. And so Job uttered these words. You're right. I don't care if you kill me. I will serve you. At that moment, God looked at the devil and says, take your hands off. He's mine. He, he He would give up his own life because he's mine. And so the devil left. You read the end of the story. Job got twice the cattle, twice the sheep, 12 new kids. At the end of the story, Job's got a big party at his house, and somebody at the party asked him, hey, Job, what do you think all that mess was you went through several years ago where you lost everything? And Job answered and said, I don't know. And he didn't. But he still loved God. God had the book of Job to point out there are people that love me for me because I'm God, and, and that's all they need. And so it's an incredible book. It's not trying to point We're always trying to, well, what do you get out of it? No, no, I just love God because he's God. And that's so, deep. Let me get it straight. So the first round, he had how many kids? Twelve. And the second round, he had how many kids? Twelve. So the woman paid a price. 
I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Whoa, that's a new revelation. <laughs> I was just sitting here thinking, okay, well, wasn't it she didn't? <laughs> no, enough said, right? Uh, that's enough said. And people would ask us, well, Joe lost 12 kids and only got 12 back. No, but when he gets to heaven, he's going to have 24 kids. God doubled everything he had. 24 years of being pregnant. Mm-mm-mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if they would written books back then, she had written a book. My I got 20, some questions for her when 20, I get to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> she's got her own mansion i bet she does okay joe i feel like i'm called to become a minister but i don't really know where to start my church doesn't provide a lot of opportunities to do this so i was thinking of starting a bible study i don't want to be taken as me starting something new outside the church do you have any suggestions I actually do. If you don't, can I jump in here? Well, Kept, you going to? Having been a pastor before, I don't think it would be wise if you start a Bible study out from under the covering of your pastor. Nope. Um, Not smart. And so, um, because I think there's a whole lot of things that could open up with that. Here's the thing: what, when when you get born again, it took me a long time to come to the realization that you're called into the ministry. The, the fivefold ministry gifts you're talking about. Where you're talking about a full time ministry gift, Prophet those are to teacher. those are to equip the saints, that mm-hmm. believers to go out and minister the gospel. Yes, everybody's in the ministry. Yeah, so so you are in the ministry now. What does that look like? Could look like getting really involved and maybe teaching a class at your church. It could look like ushering, greeting, cleaning the toilets, mowing the grass, painting the building. There's nothing wrong with meeting with your pastor and letting him know where your heart is yeah. and, and saying, this is some things I would like to do. Uh, maybe you could take me under your wing and maybe, you know, yeah. maybe I could branch out as a volunteer somewhere yeah. in some other areas of leadership. And don't be offended if he starts like, you know, like where we <laughs> have to start. But, well, well, I first thing I ever did in the ministry was I. I was just helped along with the youth. And what did you do? Children. I taught two year olds. I taught a two year old class. We had 23 two-year-olds in one class. Yeah, so and it took many years before it expanded yeah. beyond that. <laughs> yes, it now, did. Here's the great part of that was that we got to learn the ministry from the ground up. Yes, we did. So there's nobody that could, when, especially when I had a church, there's nobody that could come in and ask me something that I hadn't done it before. No shortcut. Yeah, so uh, a lot of times you're just in a training season. So uh, I think it's great. Study, develop, uh, you know, get involved. But I wouldn't go out on my own because the God, God has planned and structured the church and authority is incredibly important to him. Well, I've had several great ministers give the similar testimony that they weren't teaching anybody, but they were studying and putting notes together. And uh, one guy said, I'm, I'm just doing it for almost 20 years. I hadn't taught anybody, but I was collecting notes. Well, he's published several great books. Well, that's because he spent 20 years studying. So he's getting ready. And so people get one revelation. They are ready to do a study. Well, you don't know. You just got one revelation. There's a lot of revelation. Keep growing in the faith. Keep serving, volunteering, you know, helping people. And that's what pastors are looking for. They're looking for somebody that'll do something. They're basically looking for manual labor. <laughs> yeah. so, now, my father was a, a businessman who wanted to go into the ministry full time. Yep. But a couple of times, to be honest with you, he uh, he did it without his pastor's approval and, um, and, and, and it didn't go well. And uh, it wasn't that his heart was wrong. His heart was right. And that, that he wanted to help change people's lives. He just did. Authority is very important to God. Submission to authority is important to Critical. God. And, you know, that's why I always think it's dangerous to jump churches and everything else. Cause if God has called you there, he's called you there, just like he's called that pastor there. And then unless he's given you a release to move to somewhere else, uh, you know, you, you just might have to go to that same school of the spirit again. Yeah. So my suggestion would be get involved, get involved, get involved. Yes. Great answer. Great answer. And it, 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 there was many a year. We used to do 13 weeks of summer <laughs> camps every summer <laughs> for years, years. And I thought if I have another piece of camp food, especially <laughs> that mystery meat on Fridays where yeah, they, that was they great. Just threw everything in there. Yeah. No, I loved it. And it developed a real love for me for, for teenagers, but I wasn't, you know what? The funny thing is, is it's not what I wanted to do in the beginning. Yep. It developed into something that I really, really, yeah, I guarantee loved. you just sit, you sit down and get a piece of paper, write down the eight things you don't want to do. That'll be the first eight things going to, God's going to have you do. <laughs> He'll get rid of that don't want to do list real quick. Every time in my life I've said, <laughs> Uh, when I was in Bible college, I said two things I never want to do, work with teenagers and live in a cold climate. 
six months later, I was in Washington State working with teenagers. Come on. God's got a great sense of humor. When Joe and I started talking, I said two things I never want to do. Go back into the ministry and live in Oklahoma. Woo! Six months later, I'm back in Oklahoma. Back, back in the, in the ministry. ministry. <laughs> Yeah, God's got a great sense of humor. You're not going to outthink God. No, no, no. But just, man, listen, the greatest thing about being in ministry, whether you're full-time or or not, or whatever you consider it to look like, the greatest thing about it is loving on people. Yes. And uh, as as long as you keep people in your heart, and and that's your goal, to have their lives changed and to enrich them, to to run their race to win, I think you're going to do Because you've got something else in your mind besides people, God's going to squeeze that out of you. Mm-hmm. God's not going to have rude people be elevated in ministry. We read about it every day in the paper and magazines. Mm-hmm. People just scoop dirt in their lower lip. Why? Wrong reason. You're in this thing for the wrong reason, big boy. This is about people. God sees your heart. You might fool other humans, but you don't fool God. God sees your heart. He knows what your heart is. So you keep your heart clean. But, but I love your heart that it's for ministry yes. and it's for people. Yes. And yes. I and yes. I, yes. I think you, you're I going think, the right direction. Absolutely. All right, everybody, that is going to conclude today's Mailbag Monday. We pray you have a wonderful, wonderful week. Yes. Hey, if you get a chance, drop us a line and ask us a question or send us a prayer request. Yes. And uh, if you if you've ever if it's ever crossed your mind to consider partnering with us, um, we would sure appreciate your yes, partnership we because we covet your prayers, your friendships, and your giving also helps as well. That's what pays for this? Yes, it does. Thank you. We love you very much. Have a great week. God bless, guys. Be sure to join us Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to hear more of what God can do in your life. It's got a great future for you and your family. And we're here to help you get there. Please make sure you visit Joe McGee Ministries on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. There you find all of our Friday funny videos and other encouraging resources for you and your family. While you're at it, be sure to visit JoeMcGee.com. We have all sorts of materials, books, DVDs, you name it, all there to help you, your marriage, and your family succeed.